um, I'm Charles Yates from Grant Thornton. Um, spend all of my time working on renewable projects, a lot around uh, raising finance for them, and particularly around offshore wind. We're currently advising um, Ofgem on over a billion pounds worth of offshore wind projects, particularly around the, uh, the, the connections. So this is based on uh, practical experience that, uh, that I've had. Okay. So first of all, um, we talked to all of us in one way or another about cost reduction. Well, why is it so important? Well, I think it's critical both for the utilities, who are the predominant investors in this area. Um, they're going to need to drive down costs so they can um, compete in the uh, CFD subsidies that we've talked, uh, subsidy auctions that we've already heard about. Um, also, they're making massive investments at a time when they're under a lot of financial strain got to be financially viable. And with the digression in the subsidies, costs have got to come down as well or the numbers don't add up. Government, the funders, I think all the politicians in the UK are very much aware, as I suspect we all are, there's going to be an election next year. Um, and there's been a lot of heat and discussion about the cost of energy, that a significant part of that is the cost of, of subsidies. Um, so the politicians want to do something, or at the very least, to be seen to be doing something. Um, there's also a big thrust of EU policy towards reducing energy subsidies and using competition to do that and making the systems um, technology neutral. So for the offshore wind sector to be sustainable, to have the bright future stretching out over many years and provide us with clean, green, cheap electricity that I think we all want, um, project costs and subsidies have, have got to come down. Um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about the scale of the opportunity and of the challenge. Um, so on this slide here, I'm showing some projections of um, offshore wind capacity additions in megawatts um, over the, up to 2020. Um, the first thing I'm sure you've noticed, first of all, is 2016, 2017, uh, very, very little activity. That's the echo of the EMR hiatus. When EMR first started out, um, nobody understood it. Nobody was willing to make investment decisions. Development slowed down. And we'll, we'll see the results of that in terms of projects not coming uh, to, uh, to fruition in those two years. Um, thereafter, again, there are the FIDR projects which have got their subsidies early. They've also got higher subsidies. Um, so those projects, we can be pretty confident that they will come to market broadly when, um, when they say they will uh, because there are actually um, some penalties under the uh, CFD if they don't, they get less subsidy if they don't turn up when they're supposed to, and if they're not as big as they're supposed to be. So those ones, I think, will happen. Some of the others, I hope, will happen, but there is a history of projects slipping and maybe getting smaller. Um, but if you take these numbers at face value, that between now and 2020, there's about 300 billion pounds sterling of investment in offshore wind farms. That's a very, very big number. And ultimately, we as consumers are going to have to pay the, the cost. Um, if we can bring down the interest rate by 1% on that investment, 300 billion, that's going to save 300 million years, 300 million pounds each and every year. So clearly, there's a, there's a big prize to be had. It's definitely something that, that's worth um, happening. And I guess just to kind of reinforce that point, and I am going to try and be fairly quick because I've um, tried to crack the whip a little bit over the other speakers on timekeeping, so um, I've got to do that myself. But this is showing um, levelized costs of a, a wind farm. And at the bottom here, you've got the um, cost of equity, 24% of the levelized costs, and another 4% um, for the, the debt element. At the moment, the projects are mostly financed with equity which is why 
equity is uh, about six times bigger than, than the debt service costs. But that's 28% of the costs of the, the uh, wind farm over its entire life. Bring that down and you make a big contribution towards hitting the um, 100 pounds per megawatt hour target. But how do we do that? We all want to do that. How do we get there? Um, well, we've got to have a multi-pronged strategy. We've got to cut the cost of equity, cut the cost of debt, and also equity shareholders want a high return, debt holders want a lower return. So we want to replace some of the expensive equity with, with cheap, cheaper debt. Um, and this will happen as the sector matures, as investors get more comfortable with the um, risks that the sector uh, throws up, as people see a track record of successful profit profitable investment. Um, and that will help to bring in some very, very big pools of capital that are out there, big pools of cheap long-term capital. So there's um, 86 trillion pool of institutional equity capital, and that's starting to come in the sector and support the utilities, and in some cases, replace their equity investment. Um, cut the cost of debt, um, bond finance coming in and replacing some of the bank debt. Again, big advantage in terms of uh, providing the financing we need at the scale we need, which is, is very big, but also bringing down the cost of the finance and providing us finance over a longer period. If you've got longer to pay back the debt, then you don't need to pay back so much in each, each year. Um, also, as people get more experienced, then this process of replacing equity with debt will happen. Um, and, and what I want to do now is talk a little bit about one specific real example where this has already happened. Um, and at the top, you'll see the pricing. This was a bond that was issued to finance the um, Greater Gabard offshore transmission uh, project. Um, and because I'm a finance person, I like graphs that show prices, how they it came down quite significantly and then it's kind of bounced back. Um, but, but what happened? Well, at the end of last year, there was a 305 million pound bond um, to finance the purchase of the offshore transmission link. That's um, two transformers, one offshore, one onshore, and a, a cable connecting them. Um, that was able to access cheap long-term finance because the regulatory regime shields the investors from a lot of the risk. They don't take the risk on construction. They don't take even the risk on the wind farm operating. Um, for the off tour, as long as your cable is available, it's not broken, then you get paid. It doesn't matter whether it's actually been used or not by um, the, the uh, wind farm. Um, the interest rate, 4.137%, which is very low for these long-term massive investments. Um, 19 years to repay it. So again, that matches the life of the asset. That's very helpful in terms of getting efficient financing. Um, and interestingly and very encouragingly, um, investors wanted to buy nine million of these bonds and they were disappointed there was only three, uh, 300 million, sorry, they wanted to buy 900 million of the bonds and they were disappointed there was only 305 million. So there were a lot of investors who didn't get as many bonds as they wanted and they will come back and buy future issues and that makes it um, a, a sustainable source of finance. Um, and that will be needed there are two more off tours um, which are fairly close to requiring finance, uh, a combined value of about £660 million, pounds, and they're highly likely to be bond financed because right now in the current market conditions that's cheaper and better than, than bank finance. Um, there are also about £2 billion pounds of existing off tours for the London Array project and other operating projects. They're out there, they're working. Um, I expect there will be a rash of refinancings where people go to bond investors and say, look, this has got a proven track record. We'll raise some bond finance. We'll use it to repay the more expensive debt finance. 
And oh, by the way, the operator makes a nice little profit out of it, which is why he does it. Um, so you're going to see more and more bond financing, first of all, for the offshore transmission links, but also more and more for the actual wind farms. Um, another innovation, and, and looking at the clock, I, I won't talk too much about it now, but is bringing in some of these other sources of, of capital. So you've got your utility there, 50% um, dong, and Dong will have taken a big part of the risk, a disproportionate part of the risk. They feel they understand the construction and the operations, and they can manage this risk. So they will have taken that on with SSE. Ampere Equity Fund, which is a renewable fund out of um, the Netherlands, and PGM, which is a pension fund, they've also put money in, 25% almost, of the equity. Um, but as I say, they won't have taken 25% of the, of the risk, they'll have taken a lesser proportion because they don't feel comfortable with it, they can't manage it, they don't have the experience in the engineers and the team that Dong and SSE do. Um, and interestingly, these two guys were able to get some of their money back by refinancing it with, um, by issuing debt, um, 221 million. So that was uh, exactly what I was talking about, replacing some of their expensive equity with cheaper, cheaper debt. And that came from the Green Investment Bank and a consortium of uh, large UK banks. Um, so just looking at, if I zoom out to the macro level, if we look across Europe, who is actually providing finance for offshore wind? Well, it is still largely the utilities, 72% of that. Um, but the contractors, Siemens, GE, um, are providing significant amounts of capital because they want to sell turbines and transformers and cables. Um, but also you're getting the institutional investors. They're starting small, only 6% of the capital invested to date, but that's a growing share of the capital that's getting invested. Um, you've also got people who say, I understand what it's like to do stuff offshore and I'm willing to take risks. So you've got oil and gas companies. You've got corporate investors, people like Mitsubishi, Sumitomo, Marabeni, who want to do offshore wind back home in Japan. So they're investing and participating in projects here in the UK in part as a way of gaining experience and traction. And then quite a lot smaller, but still significant sums of money. We're still talking about billions here, infrastructure funds, specialist developers, sovereign wealth funds, Mazda has very big plans for investing in uh, renewables, and because they're coming out of the Middle East, they've got um, lots of capital to play with. And then there's some other um, interesting organizations. Final slide. So what do we as an industry need to do to bring in these new sources of cheap capital that will help to drive down costs will help to finance the expansion in the industry and, and drive it forward. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the institutional investors at the moment don't have the right team. They don't have people who understand tech technical detailed engineering, who understand the offshore environment. So they need to get comfortable with that either through their own teams or using external advisors. Um, they need to get an understanding and a track record of um, what has happened with these assets. What, is, what has gone wrong? What's gone badly? What should they expect going forward? So they can go and say, I'm not doing this just because I think it's okay. I'm doing this because there've been lots of other projects and they have been okay. Um, so the, the risk profile is, is quite important um, and getting the proven track record is the issue that will, will address that. Um, for a lot of the institutional investors, they don't do complicated construction risk. It's too, too difficult for them, too risky. So there may well be a market model where the utilities like Dong build these things. Then once the construction risk is over and there's less opportunity for a Dong with all its engineering experience and expertise um, to sell on to an institutional investor. And then Dong recycles the money into building other projects. Um, and they put their money into the high risk, high return initial phase. And then, as we're saying, 
understanding the asset and the regulation is very, very important. That's why a lot of people are spending a lot of time trying to understand EMR um, and why policy stability is, is so important and so valuable.